Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the earliest history of Latin America. And that gets us to the point of how did people get to the New World in the first place? So who are the peoples of the New World and where did they come from? So we're going to talk about Amerindian and Paleo-Indian history. Amerindian refers to ethnic and linguistic groups that share Amerindian language groups. Paleo-Indian refers to any of the inhabitants of the New World, North and South America, from before the time of about 10,000 years BC, what we would call Paleolithic cultures if we were talking in the Old World. And we're going to go over the major theories of how people got here and some of the challenges to those major theories and why it matters for studies of Latin American cultures. The first big theory, of course, is the Bering Land Bridge. Hopefully you realize we are coming out of an ice age. <laughs> we have been coming out of an ice age for about 100,000 years now. And that means that most of North America, and in fact, most of the Northern Hemisphere was covered in a vast ice sheet. All of this extra water and ice sheets lowered the ocean levels, meaning that the shallows between Asia and North America dried up and became a land bridge, this land bridge that we call the Bering Land Bridge. And the feeling was that the people who first came to North America came across this Bering Land Bridge. There's a little bit of a wrinkle in that the Bering Land Bridge would have been open to passage, but North America necessarily wouldn't have because all of North America was covered by a vast glacial sheet. But every once in a while, this glacial sheet would open up. There was a coastal glacier uh, that existed and a continental glacier. And there were periods of warming and cooling in the Ice Age. And this caused a avenue to open up. Of course, if the avenue opens up, that means that animals will come down that space. And so for a few hundred years, animals would be able to go back and forth between the old world and the new, and because humans hunted animals and were migratory, uh, they too would follow those humans, uh, follow those animals rather, uh, into the interior of North America. Now at various different times, this ice sheet was closed up and open, so it may have happened more than once. It may have happened that our ancestors followed those huge herds of megalithic fauna, such as the mammoth and the Ice Age bison, into North America, and eventually they settled there and brought their families. It's one of the greatest migrations in human history. And when we look at the first peoples of North and South America, everywhere we look, we find the same kind of tools. A tool that we have defined as the Clovis Point because it was first found in Clovis, New Mexico. They're beautiful tools. They're made out of flint or similar materials. They're what we call a bifacial blade. That means they have a sharp edge on either side. But I think the most uh, fascinating thing is the hafting groove that right here at the tail end they have very artfully took a single nap a single strike that will create a groove you can see it a little better in this modern example and this groove makes a perfect place to attach a spear so that you have a thinner section in the middle but a thicker edge where you're going to be doing your stabbing and killing so Clovis points are discovered all over the New World, all over South America and North America. And these beautiful blades then came to identify what we thought were, what we presumed to be the first human beings in the New World. And they date to approximately 13500 BC. I'm going to int alternate terms because some terms are BP, which is before present, and some are BCE, which is before the current era. So just don't get confused. Sometimes I jump back and forth. That's because I'm borrowing from different textbooks and I use the source material that they use. I use the dating systems that they use. And so it was tidy. It was neat. It was clear. 
Clovis was the first place we discovered these points, but we found them in Pennsylvania, we found them in Brazil, we found them all over Mesoamerica and Central America. So it made sense that at one or two of these points, these people migrated through this gap in the glaciers. When it receded for a few hundred years, they came down into the interior of North America, and they eventually made their way down into Central America and South America. And all native peoples today of the New World ultimately descend from them. And then it was all ruined. It was a beautiful theory, all the evidence added up, until some dumb archaeologist had to keep digging. Ah, oh, it always happens. And a very remarkable site was found way down on the southern tip of what is modern-day Chile, right here. I go through it. There. And this was Monteverde. And Monteverde was easily 2,000 or perhaps more, 2,000 more years older than the sites at Clovis. It was a, uh, a settlement that was on a river bank. Uh, they can actually recreate the settlement. There's enough wood there. They can actually carbon date it and date it to relative you know, accuracy. Now, this causes an enormous problem for the Clovis theory. And the reason it causes the problem is because if they're coming across the Bering Land Strait, that means that it would take them some time to get all the way down to the furthest tip of South America, meaning that you would expect the oldest sites would in fact be in North America and the younger sites would be in South America, but the exact opposite seems to be true. This is a problem. <laughs> and it forced us to look at things a little differently. People began so what happened? Did they migrate all the way down to South America and then migrate back to North America? That's certainly possible. Did they come along the coast? If you're traveling by boat, maybe you could get all the way down to South America a little quicker than your cousins who were taking the overland route. And it also forced people to take a second look at all these sites. Clovis reigned so large in the imagination of archaeologists that whenever they dug to a site and they got to the Clovis lair, they said, well, that's it. We know there's nothing earlier than Clovis, so we're not going to dig anymore. We dug all the way down to the Clovis lair in Clovis, New Mexico, and there was nothing after that, so there's no way there's nothing after that. Of course, you see the fallacy of the assumption. The truth is, just because Clovis was the oldest thing in Clovis, New Mexico, that doesn't necessarily mean it was the oldest thing in anywhere else. And sure enough, they started redigging some of these sites that they had excavated back in the 50s and 60s and discovered, wouldn't you know it, there are older occupation levels. So this threw enormous monkey wrench into the idea of how the Americas were peopled and where these people came from. And then we started discovering some really interesting things. Two skulls and partial skeletons were rediscovered. One was discovered in Kennewick. Uh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is just disgusting. I actually have cousins in Kennewick, so here. Let me fix something. Ugh. That's just uh, embarrassing. Okay. So, Kennewick. <laughs> Kennewick and Spirit Caveman. So, Kennewick is up in um, the, the southeastern corner of Washington State. Spirit Cave is right here in Utah. Uh, the Great Lake was, the Great Salt Lake and uh, Utah Lake were once part of a much larger Ice Age lake known as Lake Bonneville. It was a gigantic inland sea, bigger than, you know, one of the Great Lakes and uh up in the Great Lakes states. And so there were caves up along that old shoreline. Now that shoreline is, you know, several hundred feet above uh, the valley floor. But there were caves along there, and in those caves they found some remains. Now what's interesting about both of these skeletons they were discovered, uh, the Spirit Cave was actually part of an archaeological um, uh, dig. Uh, Kennewick Man was discovered by accident. He, a river had flash flooded and exposed some bones. And at first they thought it was a crime scene. They thought it was a murder victim that had been uh, buried. They later discovered, no, he's far, far too old to have been a murder victim. Well, I guess he could have been a murder victim, but he wasn't murdered recently, let him put it that way, uh, that he was this ancient skeleton. 
And so they started to dig around and recover the rest of the skeleton. When these were discovered, they were reconstructed. You can see the, the reconstruction here. And they were, let us say, peculiar. That is peculiar based on what our expectations of what these early people would have looked like. Remember, everybody was supposed to have come over from the Bering Strait. That means they would have been Asiatic peoples and largely of Asiatic stock. But these didn't look like Asians. In fact, they had very strong nose bridges, uh, very boxy skulls, and these are characteristics that we more commonly associate with uh, Indo-European peoples. Uh, it was rather unfortunate when the Kennewick Man was discovered, uh, they described it as Caucasian. Caucasian's an imperfect term even for European peoples, and this caused a huge sensation in the press. It was also complicated by the fact that uh, America has very strong cultural resource management laws that say that any remains found uh, belong to the native tribe that uh, had territorial claims over the area. So local Native Americans claimed this, the Kennewick man as their ancestor and demanded that he be reinterred. Uh, but of course, it's very rare that you find a skeleton this old, so it became a, a kind of legal case. Eventually, the university that was doing the excavation and uh, the Native Americans came to an agreement, and they agreed that once they were done with their kind of examinations, they would return him and he would be buried. But it was very unfortunate that they were described as European-ish or Caucasian because that threw an enormous monkey wrench in the works because it suggested that perhaps the earliest settlers of America were not of Asiatic descent and did not come across the Bering Land Bridge. That was really something else. So that caused people to take a good hard look at other sources of evidence. So we went back and looked at tool technology. Uh, tool technology is very specific. The way you craft a blade or make tools is very unique to your culture. Not everybody creates these beautiful bifacial blades like we see in the Clovis culture. So people said, okay, if the Clovis culture is supposed to have come from uh, you know, Siberia and Asia across the Bering Land Bridge, that we should see some earlier iteration of this technology in Asia. But of course, they didn't. In fact, they found a completely different technology called microblades, where you have a core of a flint-like or obsidian material and you uh, knock off little shards off of it, and then you embed those into a wooden uh, spear. It's a completely different kind of technology just as good in the stabby stabby cutty department, but completely different material culture, which began to make people think, well, maybe this Clovis culture is not um, Asiatic. You have these skulls that don't look necessarily Asiatic from Spirit, ba um, Spirit Bear Cave and from, uh, excuse me, from Spirit Cave and from the Kennewick Man discoveries. You have uh, Clovis and uh, points that look completely different. So let's go looking for where we can find some similar technology. And as it turned out, the closest thing that anybody could find were these Salutrian blades. Salutrian blades are these beautiful bifacial blades. They don't have the haft groove, that's new, but they do have a lot of similarities in common. But that's even more problematic because where did the Salutrian culture come from? They're a Paleolithic culture that lived in the south of France and in Spain. In fact, they're one of the cultures associated with the great cave art of the prehistoric period. So if you took the survey class, the 2710 course, uh, they were one of the cultures that created this. And so this created a new hypothesis known as the Salutrian hypothesis. And if you have two similar material cultures spread across the Atlantic Ocean, you still have a big problem called the Atlantic Ocean. How on earth do you get these European peoples to North America? Well, the answer is, again, deals with the Ice Age. Remember, the entire northern half of uh, the northern hemisphere is covered under a massive ice sheet. 
the ice sheet is going to be have an edge and along its coast it's going to be a place where seals and whales uh, you know are going to hunt and so if you had a boat you could follow that edge of the ice sheet is it possible that they could have done that as it turns out yes they could have we know that in the Paleolithic period they did have a technology that was very similar to skin boats. Skin boats, uh, which are called umiak amongst the Inuit, are still made today. Uh, they have a wooden frame and stretched over that wooden frame you have a stitched hide, usually seal hide or walrus hide, which is treated with animal fat to make it water repellent. Uh, they're very seaworthy. Uh, they continue to be made today and they can carry several people. You could rig primitive sails or paddle and if you pulled out every, you know, you know, 30 or 40 miles onto the ice, uh, you could rest, hunt, and go back on it. So you could imagine hunting parties in these umiak, these open skin boats, making it all the way across the Atlantic. That seems daunting, but the modern Inuit do things uh, just as daunting every day. So it's certainly not impossible, but it was extraordinarily a controversial hypothesis. Uh, because it upends everything that we ever thought we knew. Plus, it inverts the story. The story that everybody had thought was that the New World were their own peoples and the Europeans only came later in the 15th and 16th century. But now you create a narrative where the original peoples were perhaps from Europe. You can understand how that might be a bit upsetting. So the whole thing was a complete mess. And it honestly remains a complete mess to this day. People realize that, well, if they could have traveled by, by along the coast in skin boats from uh, northern Europe, they certainly could have done the same thing from Asia. And that opened the possibility of transoceanic contacts, that people traveling in skin boats could have traveled, say, along the Aleutian Islands, and from the Aleutian Islands down the North American coast and traveled all the way down to South America. So there are many possible sources for peopling the New World. And the discoveries just keep coming. I'm sure you've heard in the news recently of the so-called Sistine Chapel of the Amazon. An Ice Age site uh, that is more than eight miles long uh, has a series of rock wall paintings, some of which are at a height of more than 60 feet, which means they had to build scaffolding to do them. Uh, and this has recently been discovered, and it dates to at least 16,000 years before the present, uh, and perhaps much, much earlier. So it's as early as Monteverde down in Chile, and it could be a lot earlier. One of the things that indicates that it's got to be earlier is that it shows people killing and uh, Ice Age mammals. Well, most of the Ice Age mammals would have been dead in just a few thousand years after this, so they have to be around at the same time as the Ice Age mammals, so uh, that pretty much puts it into the Ice Age. They're absolutely remarkable. Uh, they're very, very sophisticated. We have a whole set of geometric patterns. We're only at the very beginning of trying to make sense of what this says. But it shows that there were people in America, at all points in America, very, very early, and we're still not entirely certain how they got there. Why is this so important? Well, it's important because it begins to impact our sense of cultural identity. Who are we and where we come from is one of the biggest questions we can ask, and that's certainly the case in the New World. Who ultimately are the ancestors of the people in the New World? Uh, later reevaluations of Kennewick Man and others have questioned those early identifications as them being Caucasian or European. In fact, they did a study where they compared the anatomy of uh, Kennewick Man to a whole series of skeletons from all over the world, and what they discovered is that they don't look quite like anybody that is alive today. 
the closest they look is to the Ainu. Now, the Ainu are actually an interesting people because they are the original indigenous inhabitants of northern Japan. In fact, they're found almost exclusively on the northern island of Hokkaido, Japan. And these people might be the descendants of the early Asiatic peoples that crossed the Bering Land Bridge. So the people that we identify as Asians today may not have been the Asians back then. And the same thing is true for Europe. After all, the people that occupied Europe, actually that we did, we had defined as Europeans, really didn't get there till thousands of years later. So it's kind of crazy calling the Salutrians Europeans. Here's something I'm gonna tell you. Race is the most superficial of all um, cultural markers. It is incredibly superficial. There are variations in population by skin color and head shape. You can forensically look at the bones of a person to determine if they're African or if they're Asian or if they're European. But by proof of the fact that any one of us can intermix and interbreed with anybody else, it's clear that there isn't any real significant differences in the races. In fact, we're now beginning to think that most of what we identify as race only really emerged in the last 10,000 years. If you go to the bones of Europe, of Asia, and of Africa 10,000 or more years ago, you will find people who look African-ish, European-ish, Asian-ish, but not exactly like the populations today. So the modern races that we understand and think of as kind of you know, permanent, didn't really exist 10,000 or even 20,000 years ago. They were different races and they had characteristics that were more in common with some races and some that were completely different. Uh, the reason this all matters is because we put so much emphasis on race. The fact that race is so superficial, biologically at least, doesn't deter us from putting so much of our cultural identity into it. In fact, when they first identified the Kennewick man as being Caucasian, that caused this group of white supremacist, uh, you know, Thor worshippers, these, uh, 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 you know, uh, neo-pagans, these radical neo-pagans, to claim that this was evidence that America was founded by Europeans and therefore belonged strictly to white Europeans, which is a ludicrous thing anyway, because I'm of Swedish derivation. I am technically descended from those Vikings, etc. And those people didn't come into that part of the world until the Iron Age. And whoever Kennewick Man was, uh, he was there 9,000 years ago. And, you know, thousands of years before the very people who were this guy says are the true Europeans ever got to Europe. So it's all ludicrous. It's all, it's all nonsense. But it shows you how hot these arguments can get. When you're talking about your cultural identity, I think you can understand why people are concerned. So where do we stand today? I think most people find the Salutrian hypothesis to be untenable, but it has not been dismissed. And like I said, much like this wonderful art in the Amazon rainforest in Colombia, we keep finding stuff that just doesn't fit our models and our theories. There's one guy who even claims that he's found something older than 100,000 years old, um, just outside the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. Uh, I think a lot of people are suspicious of that, but they're examining it and who knows. I think at the end of the day, we have to admit that the Paleo-Indians and the Amerindian line is a very diverse polyethnic group. It's derived from a number of people that came here over a very long period of time. Most of them seem to be early Asiatic. That is, they're not Asians in the way that we understand Asians, but they are the remnants of whatever early Asiatic strains existed in uh, Siberia, you know, and they're very, very similar to the Ainu, and so the Ainu are probably, again, a remnant of those early Asiatic strains. So not modern Asiatic strains, but early Asiatic strains. But there is definitely enough evidence to suggest there are non-Asiatic peoples mixed in there as well, and that those people got here 
by means other than the Bering Land Bridge, that they got here through transoceanic contacts or through coastal contacts. It's impossible to uh, deny that that's a possibility. I think the most important thing we have to know is that whatever, however these people got here, they've been here for a very, very long time. This is not a recent intrusion of humanity uh, into the world. At least 14,000 years before the present, nearly every square inch of the New World was occupied by these peoples, and probably a lot earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if we found evidence. Some of the earliest um, art and, and Paleolithic art, they just discovered a painting in Indonesia that dates back to maybe 40,000 years ago. And I wouldn't be surprised if we found things in the New World that old. You know, we used to think, you know, when I went to graduate school, it was like, nope, Clovis was the end. There's nothing before Clovis. Don't bother looking because it doesn't exist. And then we found lots of stuff that existed before Clovis. So I, I, have, I have had my faith in modern archaeology shattered too many times to accept the narrative that exists. Uh, I'm not suggesting we're going to find ancient aliens, you know. I'm not suggesting we're going to find Atlantis. Heaven's sakes, no. There are limits. But I do think that we could find much older cultures uh, and evidence of much older occupation in the New World than we ever possibly dreamed. So let's move on. What happens once these people are here? Well, then we start moving into what we call the Archaic Period. So 12,000 to 3,000 years before the present, uh, it varies by region. But generally, after this Paleo-Indian period, we move into what we call the Archaic period. And this is where we have the transition from hunter-gatherers, who are mostly killing and gathering their food, to agrarian societies, that is to farmers, to people who you know, move around to follow the food, because they're following migrating herds of animals, to people who produce their own food. It's where we start to see the first permanent settlements. This is where we have the development of ceramics and fiber arts. And it's also where we have the development of agriculture. And in the New World, that means maize, corn. Corn is the big staple crop, and it will become perhaps the most important crop in all of the New World. Quite frankly, it's the most important crop in the world today. Have you ever figured out, have you ever seen how much corn is produced and how Corn is in everything. I'm drinking a Coke right now with corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. Ah, that's good diabetes right there. Anyhow, um, so it's everywhere. Corn is this essential crop, and it was no less essential in the ancient world. So where does corn begin? Where does the beginnings of agriculture begin? It begins in southern Mexico. All the evidence is that it starts in southern Mexico. It's going to be starting in these high semi-arid valleys in Mexico, and then it migrates into South America, and it also migrates up into North America. We have a number of caves or shelters that exist that show the earliest evidence of teosinte and maize production. So we have, for example, uh, the Shuatoxla uh, shelter. This is in the Balsas River Valley. Perhaps the most important is the Coscatlan cave in the Tehuacan Valley in near Pueblo, Mexico. This thing was occupied for nearly 10,000 years. So for 10,000 years, archaic Mesoamericans were living in this valley. But it's the last phase, the Abejas phase, which is the late archaic phase, where they finally developed this thing we call maize. Uh, here you can see the excavation of it. There were more than 28 layers of occupation. That shows you how old this cave was. 10,000 years, 28 layers. That means that a new floor was made 28 different times. And that represents centuries and centuries of occupation. And inside this cave, we find what would possibly be the first corn cob. Can't see it? There it is. <laughs> and there is a pen for scale. Yikes! It's a lot different than the beautiful full ears of summer corn we're used to today. And in fact, for most of the history of the development of corn, it actually was 
not even that good. This is uh, Teosinte compared to an early cob of maize. And so it's during this time period that we see the production of maize and teosinte. But it's not just that, it's also the production of an incredible wealth of agricultural products and New World crops that include squash, beans, tubers, yams, potatoes, but also culturally significant crops. Not just food crops that are, are great food crops, but crops that have importance for the culture. Things like cacao or amaranth, peppers, uh, magwe and agave, cotton, tobacco, uh, so many. So you start with this thing called teosinte and it's a tiny little grain that has these little kernels on a stalk. The kernels break very easily, but slowly they select out for kernels that stick together, and this creates the first cobs. And so somewhere around 5,000 years before the present, corn, something like what we know it exists. The cobs are only a couple inches long, but that's enough. And then slowly they develop them into these larger cobs until by the time we get to the formative period, something like 2000 BC, we have cobs of corn looking much like we do. It's an amazing story, and it's an amazing technological advance to take things like teosinte, which you see over here on the left, and turn it into uh, beautiful corn, such as these examples of modern uh, Mayan corn from uh, the Yucatec Maya. So uh, the corn is really, really important. The reason corn is so important is because it is a high yield food. Every stalk produces multiple ears of corn. Compare that to grain, you know. Every stalk of grain only has one ear, you know. Every stalk of wheat only has one ear. But a stalk of corn has multiple ears of corn. The second thing is that those corn cobs are much bigger than the ear on something like uh, wheat or oats. And finally, they are just nuggets of starch, just energy packed and lots of them. So you have a food that is both high yield and um, high quality, nutritious, but also very dense in food value. And that's part of the reason why so many people grow corn today. Because when you grow a field of wheat, uh, you only get these tiny little heads and a lot of straw. But at the end of growing a field of corn, you get really densely packed high caloric, um, you know, kind of quality food. Corn produces per acre anywhere from three to five times the food value, the calorie value of a field of wheat. Uh, potatoes is even higher. Potatoes and sweet potatoes produce 10 times the food value of an acre of wheat. So an acre of potatoes is worth 10 acres of wheat. That's just astonishing. Same thing with corn. Corn is three or four times uh, you know, the food value. And this is the source of all the wealth that exists in the New World. This is the source of their civilization, because without this, they couldn't have built anything else. Food value in the Old World is very dispersed. You have to grow a lot of wheat to get food out of it, but you, on, you could but you only have to grow a few acres of corn to get your value out of it, which means you can maximize your food value, which means you can have much larger, much denser populations. And that's just one food crop. I wanna point this out. They had squash, they had beans, they had yams and sweet potatoes and tubers. The food value in the new world is much, much denser and quite frankly, more nutritious than the food value in the old world. And then you add all these enhancements onto it, things like peppers, tomatoes, avocados, uh, you know, and of course, uh, things like cacao chocolate, holy crap. Uh, it's a much, much richer agricultural world, and it shows the inherent genius of new world peoples that they made this incredible explosion. And just think of it, we talk about the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is where the Old World and the New World meet, and in Latin America you have this mix of New World and Old World crops. Well, the Old World brings things like wheat and barley, which are 
labor intensive, not very nutritious, and don't have a lot of food density. And the New World brings things like corns and beans and squash and tubers and tomatoes and things that have flavor, and etc. Uh, think about peppers. Think about, you know, chocolate and peppers and all these things. They're now all over the world. And it was uh, amazing when the conquistadors came to the New World. They were shocked at the variety of foods available relative to the kind of foods that were available in their own markets in terms of fruits and vegetables. And not surprisingly, this impacts the culture greatly. Every single one of these Mesoamerican or Andean civilizations will have a corn god. Every single one. Maize is the staff of life. And you see it in the representation of their art. Here is a wonderful little terracotta corn stalk where the corn god is emerging from the corn stalk. Corn then becomes a symbol of life. It becomes a symbol of regeneration and rejuvenation. And every single one of them will have corn as not just a major crop, but as a major part of their visual culture. Uh, corn, both the corn stalks, the cobs, and the materials made from corn, the masa, the meal, anything. They also used to make it into mash and turn it into an alcoholic uh, drink, a fermented corn mash. All of those things become major offerings, they become major trade items, and they become offerings to the gods. And you can see this in later artwork. Here you have the variety of foods being given to Chico Mecato, uh, Seven Serpents. Here there are offerings of corn, of squash, of peppers, and it was just an incredible amount of wealth. And many of these were not just major food staples, they were huge enhancements to the quality and the taste of food. One of the biggest and most important is gonna be cacao. Cacao is grown in pods, but you crack the pods open and it has this white pulpy fruit. And most people have never had a, uh, the, a, a cacao fruit. It's a beautiful, it's a taste fantastic. It tastes like a berry and it, 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 you, there's no way to transport it because it's a tropical fruit, it just goes rotten that quickly. Uh, so what we know, we experience are the seeds. So the seeds inside are taken out, they're allowed to ferment and then you crack them open and there's a nib and it's from that nib that you get the solids and the cocoa butter that we make chocolate out of. But anciently this was used everywhere. They would eat not just the fruit itself, they would roast the nibs, they would take the nibs, and they would use these to make all kinds of enhancements. And it was a universal spice and flavor enhancer. They tended to love savory drinks. And in fact, as you go all over the Mesoamerican world, you will see very the most beautiful vessels, these beautiful cylindrical story vessels um, that we see from the Baya are all caco vessels. They're all chocolate drinking vessels. Uh, the chocolate would be brewed into a drink. It would often be mixed with peppers and also other things. Uh, it's a very spicy uh, brew that they're creating in these things. Nothing like what we would consider hot chocolate or chocolate to be, um, which was which is mostly sweet and mixed with milk, which they didn't have. Instead, it would be this very uh, intense spice. It would almost be like a curry in its, in its uh, qualities. I've had it. It's really amazing. Uh, and it was a very, very popular drink. It also, too, has divine connotations and was used as uh, an offering in many cases. There's also crops that are really unique to these cultures. Amaranth was a crop that was a major staple for Mesoamericans. It's domesticated quite a bit later. Uh, than corn, and not as important as corn, but it has these beautiful, tall, uh, you know, fuchsia-colored stalks or magenta-colored stalks that produce a seed. Uh, it was harvested in Aztec times and in Mesoamerican times, and it's actually made into a dough. It's making a comeback. Uh, it was actually banned by um, the Christians when they came in because they would make it into a dough to make food, but they would also use that dough to make images of their gods, to show the connection between the living earth and their gods. So amaranth dough was a modeling material because it had this close association to Aztec deities, the Spanish banned it, and for a long time it was not allowed to be harvested. And then, of course, the gluten-free uh, thing uh, craze kicked off, and because it's gluten-free and it has lots of nutritious value, uh, it's now, you know, surging in popularity. But it's not just things like that. There are things like the maguey plant, uh, agave, 
which is stripped of its, um, of its fibers. Those fibers are used to make clothes and shoes and all kinds of materials. And of course, if you're a fan of tequila, uh, you know about <laughs> Bagua uh, because the, the inner kind of root of it is uh, roasted, fermented, and is used to make pulque, which is this kind of brewed drink. And then later this is turned into mezcal and tequila and a bunch of other things. And of course, this is so important that the Aztecs even have a goddess, uh, Macuil, who is specifically the goddess of the Macuay. And you can see that she has this uh, Magüe plant coming out. And here you can see the brewing of pulque, this um, very potent drink. All of this is to say that from the time of the early formative period, about 3,000 years uh, BCE, we have a very diverse and healthy diet in the New World. In fact, healthier than in the Old World. I would much rather have been living in the New World <laughs> than in the Old World. Uh, you know, when, and you can tell this looking at skeletons. You can actually see this looking at skeletons. Old world skeletons in the medieval world, uh, very few people still have their teeth when they're old. Uh, they often have very weak or brittle bones or all kinds of nutritional deficiencies. That's not true in the new world. The skeletons are beautiful. They have, you know, intact teeth and all kinds of, of wonderful health, even down to the poorest level sometimes. Of course, elites have better bone quality because they have a better diet, but you do see a high quality diet for lots of different populations. There was lots of things to feast on, and they enjoyed many different types of foods, and those only increased as time went on, and food became a very uh, important part of it. The one area that is different is the lack of animal domestication. There is never a major amount of animals that are domesticated in the New World for a variety of reasons. Um, when the Columbia Exchange happens, that's what the New World basically dives into. They, they take on to pigs and chickens and, and, uh, and goats and sheep, and, and they adapt all of that, and especially horses and mules and pack animals. None of that existed in the ancient uh, Latin America. Uh, if you wanted to carry something, yes, in the South they had llamas, but llamas aren't much of pack animals, to be perfectly honest, and alpacas are even smaller. So most of it was carried by hand. You had uh, these clamene. Uh, clamene are, are uh, porters, human porters that are trained from a young age to be able to carry these 80-pound packs, which they did with great efficiency. A few animals were domesticated, dogs, a few fowls, turkeys, guinea pigs. Uh, dogs were both uh, guard dogs, protectors, pets. Uh, hairless dogs are kind of like uh, living water bottles, <laughs> like a hot water bottle, something to keep you warm at night, and because skin-to-skin -skin contact is great. And some of them were bred to be uh, food animals. Uh, so I joke that the Chihuahua is the Aztec chicken. Uh, we really don't know exactly where the Chihuahua came from. But animals like those were very common. Uh, in the south, of course, they had llamas and alpacas. And while these weren't terribly good pack animals, uh, they could carry, the llamas are bigger and they can carry some packs. They were a major source of meat, they were sacrificial items, and they also produced wool, beautiful wool, camelid fibers. So if there's something that distinguishes the Andean zone and South America from North America, is that in North America they were relying on deer pelts and skins, uh, agave, maguey fiber, and cotton. They did have cotton, whereas in the South they had wool. Uh, they had camelid fibers from both alpacas and llamas, and they produced beautiful uh, textiles. So the north is going to be richer in some ways. Mesoamerica is going to be richer in some ways. The south is going to be richer in other ways. It's an interesting uh, amount of diversity, and all of it is built on this. Uh, incredible agricultural wealth created during the Archaic period. And that's why I'm talking about this, because agriculture is the base of of civilization in the new world. Um, it is clear that without this agriculture they couldn't have had the complex and diverse societies they have. They wouldn't have had the stratification of labor, uh, they wouldn't have had the diversification of labor and the social stratification and hierarchies, and all of this of course leads to urban living, central religious shrines, uh, scribes, uh, priestly castes, kings, elites, 
and all of the art that we see. And so much of the art, as I've demonstrated, is going to be a reflection of the agricultural world. Now, I do want to make a mention here uh, that sometimes uh, there are some very, very bad uh, kind of theories that postulate about things um, and the nature of things. I'll just say his name, Jared Diamond. So Jared Diamond wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and the premise of the book was that why is Western civilization, why does it have so much more richer material culture or just flat out material wealth than these other cultures? And I find his thesis to be reductive, simplistic, and wrong. Let me just put it out there. His argument is, is that Western civilization arrived at just the perfect time to take advantage of certain crops and certain features, uh, such as domesticated animals. And you will hear this in a lot of literature. You will hear this in a lot of literature, that the reason that people in the New World did not develop domesticated animals is because they didn't have any animals to domesticate that uh, the New World was just didn't have the right kind of animals, sheep and goats and camels and things, to domesticate, while the Old World did, and this is why the Old World prospered and the New World never developed these features. And I think this is, in fact, a backhanded insult to New World cultures. Uh, the truth is, there are plenty of animals uh, available for domestication in the New World, and they did domesticate a bunch of them. Uh, you certainly can domesticate deer. Several cultures have domesticated deer from time to time. You certainly can domesticate you know, wild sheep. There are wild sheep in America. And you could have domesticated bison. Uh, the first cattle domesticated in the old world uh, were big, terrifying you know, bulls. <laughs> and bison, you know, the theory is, oh, bison is just undomesticatable. But that's not true. We have domesticated bison today. We've done it. <laughs> and they could have done that if they wanted to. Uh, of course, bison is a North American animal, but there are other animals that they could have domesticated. So the question is, uh, you know, it, rather than assuming that they didn't because they didn't have access to those things, we have to assume that they didn't because they had a reason not to. And I think this shows the genius of Latin American cultures, at least pre-Columbian cultures. Uh, they didn't domesticate animals because they didn't have to. They found a better way. And the better way was this incredible agricultural diversity that they had. Again. The agricultural products of the New World are far more calorie dense, far more high yield, which means it's less work. You know, you have to farm less. Uh, they're far more high yield, far more calorie dense, and far more nutritious than the Old World crops. So if you're getting that much food value out of your agriculture, you don't need to domesticate animals. Why bother? Uh, and I think that's a large part of it. The other thing is that it's a lot of it is culture. Many of these New World cultures practice something that we would call quasi-domestication. Uh, they had a preference for game meats. They liked wild deer and wild animals to eat. They didn't like domesticated animals. Well, if you like wild animals, and especially if you have cultural preferences to things like hunting, uh, you're not going to domesticate animals. Instead, what you'll do is you'll domesticate the landscape. You'll keep the apex predators at bay. Uh, you'll burn out the underbrush to create the kind of brush that fosters the animals that you like to eat, like deer, and then you will um, have a ready source and available of, of game meat whenever you want to go do it. So this idea of domesticated animals <laughs> equals civilization is the problem. That domesticated animals equals high civilization is one of these assumptions of Jared Diamond's hypothesis, and it's absolute nonsense. It doesn't. There are many, many different ways to create high-level cultures, and clearly the cultures of the pre-Columbian world were very, very high cultures, even if they didn't have uh, domesticated animals. I have no doubt they were smart enough to uh, create domesticated animals, but they didn't need to because they found a better way, a different way. And I, and I think that's a very, very important point to make. Sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but I think it's a very, very critical, important point to make about these early cultures. Do not assume that they did something because they didn't have access to it, or they lacked the intellectual ability, or they just didn't have the idea. Uh, we see toys in, in the pre-Columbian world that have wheels. We know that they knew about the concept of wheels. Um, and so people say, well, why didn't they ever develop chariots and carts? Well, that's an assumption. The assumption is that they, they were too stupid to develop roads. 
But the truth is, roads are hard. Roads require huge teams and groups of individuals to level a space to make a road. And that's an enormous investment, particularly if you're living in some place like the Andes, which is a very rocky high environment and a very difficult environment to make a road or a highway through. So what they did instead was they developed native porters who were um, trained by guilds and they were very, very efficient and they were very, very good at their job. They found a different way, a better way, a way that worked for them. And you also have to consider you know, okay, they understood what a wheel is, they put it on toys, but if you are going to make a cart, and that cart is going to cover a wide area, you have to put up this enormous investment to build the road to make the cart worthwhile. And so if you don't develop the cart, then you save all the money that you would have invested in building the road. And I know this is true because the same thing is true in Islamic culture. Uh, and when the Islamic world came in and conquered large sections of North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean, the cities completely change. They completely change. The wide roads that were preferred by Romans and Byzantines so they could handle horse carts disappear and they get turned into narrow roads, roads that could suit camels because Muslims liked camels because camels could cross the desert and horse carts couldn't. Horse carts were pretty much good from going from city to city, but if you were trading vast distances across the desert, you didn't have the resources or you didn't want to invest the resources in putting a gigantic road out there, you would go with a camel, but a camel can go through a narrower road. So the cities were all transformed and the roads got narrower. Um, they found a different way. They found a better way. Never assume that the way your culture does things or a way historical culture that does things is better. And that's one of my chief objections to Jared Diamond and his terrible, awful, no good, uh, worthless, reductive, simplistic book. <laughs> Most of his books are like that. Is that not only does uh, he make these ridiculous, simplistic arguments about Western civilization, but in the process, he backhands all these other non-Western civilizations uh, by, by inferring that they're inferior in some way. Oh, uh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Uh, and you'll hear a lot about these books because uh, they're used in non-Western circles a lot to, to basically argue uh, against, you know, Western views. And they keep popping up and, oh my gosh. Okay, this rant has been brought to you by Travis Lee Clark's Angst. Because I was forced to read this crap in grad school and I'm not going to force you to do it. Okay, moving on. So this becomes the basis of our two civilizations. And let's talk about our two major zones of civilizations. We, again, have two major zones, one in South America, and that's largely Andean and mostly Northern Andean. And it's going to be places like Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, but mostly Peru. And this is where we're going to find the cultures Chavan, Moche, Inca, Chimu, uh, Chico Norte, which is a really new culture that's only been discovered in the last 20 years. Really cool stuff. Then we have the other one, which is Central America. Uh, and Central America is Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica just means Middle America. And these are predominantly the cultures of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, El Salvador. We go a little bit as far south as places like uh, Nicaragua and, uh, and uh, Costa Rica, uh, but not very far. Most of the zone is going to be Mexico, Guatemala, a little bit of Honduras, Belize, El Salvador. And these are going to be the Olmec, the Zapotec, the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec, um, the various different cultures in and around those areas. And it has a few different zones of concentration. Let's talk about the differences. Andean civilization is... Now, I have to rewrite this, I guess, because these new discoveries are coming, that the Andean civilization, it was thought that the earliest phase of this would be about 900 BC. We now know that's not true. We now know that the Chico Norte culture goes back maybe as far as 3000 BCE. We used to think that the Olmec on the Veracruz and Tabasco coast in Mexico was the oldest civilization in the New World. And it now appears that it has been toppled. Chico Norte in, uh, down in uh, Peru appears to predate it by maybe as much as a thousand years. That's incredible. So I need to update this chart. So Andean civilization goes from the Chico Norte culture, maybe 3000 BC, but the real time when it starts to get going 
is the Chauvin culture 900 BC and it goes all the way to the conquest and the Inca in 1535 and it is primarily a, a collection of empires it's really amazing how these tend to be tightly organized social systems and states with civil bureaucracies etc the Wari, Tuanaku, Inca, the Chimu all have these kind of centralized states and they have vast trading and communication networks. They also have advanced metalworking, really incredible metalworking, as you can see in this Sikon mask. They have oodles and oodles of copper, silver, and gold. There's just a lot more um, metal value and metal worth and, and metal resources in South America than there is in Mexico at this time. Later, there will be huge discoveries of silver in Mexico, but not at this time. And so they have a lot more metalworking. Uh, you know, they literally covered temples in gold plates. Uh, the Mesoamerican sphere doesn't have that much gold or silver, honestly. If you took all of the gold discovered at all of the Mayan sites, you could put it in a large shoebox. It's not that much. Whereas, you know, it, it literally took rooms to fill all the gold of just the Inca. Uh, they also are a non-literate culture, but there's a qualification there. That is, they don't have any writing systems. They did have histories, and they did keep records. They have a thing called a kipu, which we'll talk more about in a second. Mesoamerican civilization uh, then uh, is a little bit different. It goes all the way to the pre-classic or formative period, which maybe goes back 2000 BC, but really kind of more around 1600 BC. Uh, and it goes all the way up to the time of the conquest in 1521. And it is a series of rival you know, polities. It is not a region of empires. You don't have a single central state controlling vast territories. Instead, you either have decentralized city-states that are constantly in a state of warfare, like in the Mayan sphere, Copan, Tikal, Palenque, etc. Or you have kingdoms with tribute states, places like Teotihuacan or the Aztec. Although there's debates about whether Teotihuacan is a true empire or not, it might be. But I think generally, we, even the Aztec are not really an empire. What they do is they conquer an area and they say, okay, you're now conquered, which means we're going to expect tribute. But they don't really control these outlying states. They let them control themselves, and then they use fear to keep the outer systems in line. Uh, <clears throat> bonus points to whoever picked up that line and its pop cultural reference. Uh, and they, they basically counted on tribute. And whereas the Inca are really do are creating an, you know, a vast civil bureaucracy that are controlling things. They also believed in intensely ritualized warfare and nationalistic deities, but they were literate. Um, most of these cultures do have some kind of writing, but the writing varies. The Maya have a complete writing system that's very advanced. The Toltec and the Aztec have picture writing, but it's different. It isn't a complete writing system in the way that we understand it. So here, for example, you can see that, you know, the Inca are controlling territory from Ecuador all the way down to Argentina and Chile, whereas the warring states of Mesoamerica are kind of, you know, only really kind of tightly focused into areas and never cover that same kind of vast territory. Religion is very important in both cultures and um, both cultures have large pantheons of gods. Uh, the Aztec probably have more gods than any other civilization I know of. When, when the Spaniards came there, they said, wow, it was a land of a thousand gods. And thousand is probably lowballing it. <laughs> they probably have more than a thousand gods. Uh, and so religion is very important and sacrifice is very important. This is a key characteristic of all New World cultures. It's kind of hard to wrap our heads around, but sacrifice, and in particular human sacrifice, are major parts of, of, of New World cultures. Ritualized warfare, uh, where the victims and the prisoners of war were seen as you know, uh, gifts to the gods, uh, that was a major feature of both Mayan and Aztec civilization. We used to think that Andean civilization wasn't nearly so violent. We used to think that, uh, that they would only commit sacrifice in a few instances, but we're now changing that. If you look at this vase, this vase comes from the Moche culture. The vessel shows uh, a sacrifice scene, which seems to be pretty bloody. Uh, the Inca would sacrifice um, uh, nobles 
probably princesses in times of need. But we used to think that sacrifice in the Andean zone was pretty rare, that you know there was a crisis, a king died, there was a famine, and then they would sacrifice in those cases. But particularly at Chimor, where there are new excavations at Chimor, Chimor is the capital uh, of the, um, uh, well, it's uh, Chimor is the uh, culture that predated the Incas and was conquered by the Incas, and Chan Chan is their capital. And we're now finding caches of hundreds of skeletons, in some cases, dozens of prepubescent skeletons. So evidence of mass, mass human sacrifice. That's a very complicated issue. Uh, and we also have to understand it from their cultural context, but it is a major feature. And when we talk about writing again, we do have a variety of writing systems in the Mesoamerican world. Again, Toltecs, Aztecs, Mixtecs, they have a writing system, but it's mostly picture writing. It's there as a mnemonic device to help an or, or assist an oral historian. It doesn't give you every detail. It doesn't write out every single word. But the Maya have a truly full-formed writing system that is just as advanced as any writing system out there. And because of that, scribes are elites. Uh, alas, we only have three, three and a half uh, surviving books of the Maya because hundreds of these books were destroyed. Uh, by the conquistadors and later. Now, I said that the Inca do not have a writing system, but that may not be true. The quipu is a series of knots, and each thread is a different color, it has a different texture, and it is a series of different knots that are tied in different ways and exist at different lengths along their thread. And this was a kind of record keeping. And for the longest time, the assumption was that at most this could record things like dates, numbers, you know, a census, things like that. But there's been a couple of really incredible studies. Uh, an individual went up into these high Andean villages amongst the Quechuas, and he got them to hand over their quipus. He got them to talk about their quipus. This was a tradition that survived well into the 18th century in these very remote high Andean villages. And we are beginning to believe that these knots are in fact more than just simple record keeping or dates, that they actually record uh, histories, that they can actually record literature. So there's been a few studies on this recently that might break this wide open and we might actually discover that, wow, there's an incredible breadth of knowledge that is encoded in these knots. What an amazing discovery. What an absolute amazing discovery. And also what an amazing innovation, a language with a script based upon knots and this way that they're tied. Uh, I have a son, he loves to crochet and knit. And when I told him this, it was just, he was geeking out about it uh, because he says it makes perfect sense because, you know, you can transcribe a crochet pattern into text because you, that's how you do crochet is you read the text and it tells you exactly how many knots and what order to tie. So he said, why couldn't you turn, you know, it's already, we've turned it into information. Why not use that information for something uh, remarkable? So it's really, really cool. So that's our kind of introduction into these two major cultures, these two zones, how they got there, how the peopling of the Americas happened, and how we had this incredible uh, creation of agricultural wealth. We will start next time with Andean civilization. We'll start with the Chico Norte culture, this culture that we've really only known about um, at the Carl Supe complex for about 20, 25 years. It's only been excavated since the 90s and really only published in the 2000s. So it's really, really new and it's changing what we think about Andean civilization. So we'll start there. We'll do Andean civilization next week. That's a long lecture, so it's a two-part lecture. So hang in there. And then we'll, after that, next week after that, we'll start jumping into uh, some Mesoamerican cultures. So thank you very much and for hanging tight. I really appreciate it. And remember, Jared Diamond sucks. If you get one thing out of this lecture, it's Jared Diamond sucks. Okay, moving on.